words and the stories mean, you can just take your mouse and highlight it, and it will tell you the definition of the word. Then we're not really testing your reading level because part of reading is the ability to understand and figure out the words that you're reading. But the universal tools include the calculator and a spell checker so you don't have to spell and a glossary tool for the kids. And it's embedded in the test. I got asked to talk about psychometrics. This is a webinar uh, that was produced by McGraw-Hill. They're one of the publishers of these assessments called Psychometric Issues for the, the New Tests. They define psychometrics as the design, administration, and interpretation of tests for the measurement of psychological variables, such as intelligence, achievement, aptitude, and personality traits. That is, in fact, what psychometrics is. That's a pretty good definition. Here's Smarter Balanced. Strong focus on computer adaptive technology, series of interim tests, have the emphasis on performance tasks, so we can see how the child attacks it, how, well, how easily they get frustrated, are they willing to try different areas of topics. Psychometric approaches in Smarter Balanced, we're going to use best industry practices, and then it talks all about how we make sure that Smarter Balanced is, in fact, doing psychometric testing. And that's their own document. Psychometric testing, um, this is the computer. The content must be assured along with psychometric information in selecting items. So they select the items in a way that is designed to elicit other than academic information. Um, it can talk about, in, in one of the sample questions uh, that I saw, it, it um, talked about U.S. foreign aid and how our levels of foreign aid to Afghanistan resulted in uh, those poor Afghanis flying planes into the World Trade Center on September 11th. They weren't Afghans and they weren't poor. But by manipulating the information that's presented in tests, we can change what our kids think and then by designing questions, we can move them into a correct answer. So the new GED test, for example, has a section on global warming that says it's existing and it's because of human industrial activity and population growth, and the child is uh, instructed to use the data in the test to give the correct answer about global warming. Global warming is the source of one of the biggest debates in America today. People are lined up on every side of it. But this test only gives one piece of information. And if the child doesn't agree, they won't have any data to support their answer. So it's a manipulation <coughs> through the test. And the test items are selected to allow them to do that. This is the Smarter Ballad. Uh, this is from their own memorandum. You know, you hear always that these tests are valid and reliable, and I know a lot of people are thinking about whether or not they're going to opt out. The test says that the test reliability will be, um, you're gonna, they're going to start pilot testing in December of 2014. Then they're going to do their first administration in 2015, which is now, that once they're administered in 2015, then they'll be able to see if they're valid. And so all of the projections and all of the things you're hearing about validity right now, and it says these, they mostly reflect future plans. These tests are not valid, and Smarter Balance says so in their own internal documents. So I looked at, well, what happens in these smarter balance tests? And this is one of the, this is actually a practice test. You can go online and find it. The gentleman who wrote this critique is actually um, a big fan of Common Core. So he was really excited to see the test. So he went through a number of samples. In the interest of time, we're not going to go through all of them. This is the first one. Uh, this was a 10th grade exam. So there's two cars. Justin's car can, can travel 77 and a half miles with three and one ten gallons of gas. When was the last time you saw gas given in fractions instead of decimals? Kim's car can travel 99 and a fifth miles with three and a fifth gallons of gas. At these rates, <coughs> they didn't give you a rate. A rate would be miles per gallon. You have to figure out the rate. They didn't ask you to figure out the rate. But they didn't give it to you either. So the, the internal structure of the question is poor. How far can each car travel with a gallon of gas? Drag each person's car to the number line to show the number of miles. And so what they have on the, 
Um, this is what the child sees, and then they're supposed to put their mouse on the car and drag it along and like park it on top of the correct answer. Now you will notice that all of the correct answer, all of the, there's no fractions in there. They're all whole numbers. So our evaluator said the first problem is it didn't give a rate. The second problem is he started to drive the car along. And as he got, the correct answer to one of them was 25. As he got to like 24 and 3 quarters, the mouse jumped and the car sat on 25. You couldn't put the mouse on a, there was no fraction. So if a child did the problem wrong and got an answer of 25 and a quarter, and he tried to put the mouse on 25 and a quarter, the computer would push it back to 25. So you wouldn't know, if you were grading it, that the child actually did it wrong. If the child thought the answer really was 25 and a quarter, that would be intensely frustrating because I can't get it to be what the answer is. Or if the child goes, you know, smart kids, computers, it does that. I'm going to take the mouse and go real slow. Click. Good. I'm going to take the other car real slow. Click. They didn't do the math at all. Because that's what kids do. Have you ever watched teenagers with computers? If there's a way to beat the system, they beat the system. Which means that you have no idea from the construction of this answer if they, if they did the math at all, much less if they did it right. So what information did it give you? None. So we're on to the second question. And the second question says, a circle has as its center, uh, it was a, you're supposed to assume it's an x, y axis, but that's all you see. Six and seven, it goes through the point one, four. The second circle is tangent at the, to the first circle at the point one, four and has the same area. What are the possible coordinates for the center of the second circle? Show your work or explain how you found your answer. Now, if you were given a problem that said, this circle is here and that circle is here, and put these together, what would be the very first thing you would do? Wouldn't you draw the circles? The computer won't let you. You get a box. There's no mechanism in the test for the kids to be able to draw a circle. So they have to try to write about it. How, how do you write about that? And how do you put that together in your head? And it's a timed test. Can you imagine the frustration level of these 10th graders and the insanity of a test that's constructed like this? Moving past Smarter Balance, the federal government made money available, and you heard about the stabilization fund. You got st and Race to the Top was a part of that. In order to get the money, you had to say you would put together a database and the standards. Your state got mm, $266 million in stabilization money. You also applied for race to the top money, and you tried to get a waiver against that 100% that proficiency for ESEA. So you did all three things to, to try to get as much money in as you could and to get away from as many federal waivers as you could. The first thing you had to do was say that you would adopt, you would create a database. And not only did the feds mandate that the database exists, they told you what it had to contain. Then they gave the states training sessions, and this is actually the handouts from the training sessions. The data had to connect early childhood, post-secondary, and labor data. It had to connect students and teachers, be available to the research community, cross state lines. It had to include all the elements of the America Competes Act, student enrollment and student transcript, that doesn't sound too bad until you think about all the things you tell a school when you enroll your child and all the things that are included in your child's transcript, including disciplinary records. So this year, for example, in Texas, two nine-year-old boys were having an altercation in the parking lot. One of them had evidently just seen the movie The Hobbit. And so he said to the other one, you better stop or I'm, I have the one ring and I'm going to make you be invisible. And he was suspended for making terroristic threats. And the father came into the school and said, you know there really isn't a one ring, right? Like, he really couldn't make the child invisible. These were two little boys, you know, jawing at each other in the parking lot. It was pretend. And the school said, and it was quoted in the local papers, that they were protecting their children from all terroristic threats, magical or otherwise. <laughs> Except that child's permanent record in the database from the time he is nine years old, says he's making terroristic threats. 
It was a P through 20 system. P was preschool. K through 12 is what you think. 13, 14, 15, 16 is college. 17, 18, 19, 20 is the workforce. And as it got bigger each year, it eventually included post-secondary, early education. There's your labor data, your financial records, and your health records are all included in the data system. In Tennessee, they actually call it the 360 degree view of the child. Your state additionally received uh, money from the National Center for Education Statistics. You got about four and a half million dollars. And what did you tell the National Center you were going to do with the money? That you'd already met all 10 of the required elements. So you were going to use this money to link state K through 12 data systems with early child, early learning, post-secondary education, workforce, social services, and other critical agencies. And you got a little over $4 million to do that. So did you do it? Yeah, absolutely you did. You took the money. Here's the essential elements that every state had to put in, the same ones we just saw. And West Virginia is yellow, which means you have all 10. Your state in your um, race to the top said that you were also going to be incorporating a common set of data elements. See, if the data has to be able to cross state lines, then there can only be one database. Because otherwise, it, it can't cross. If you've ever done computer programming, if I code this as a 6 and you code it as a 7, we can't talk to each other. And your state said, well, you went to the common education data standards. Here is the common education data standards. It's a, from the US Department of Education. It's the P through 20, early learning through post-secondary and workforce environment. And there's all different data standards. There's over 400 data points. This is, I just pulled one screen. You notice that this one includes your dental records. Disciplinary records, health screening. Did you ever deal with children and youth? military service, income levels, they're all in there. I just pulled one screen. You can see there's A through Z. And if you, if you look that up, you'll find it. Additionally, your state said that you had developed a partnership with the Department of Health and Human Resources to gather early childhood education data. They are maintaining records on children receiving pre-kindergarten through their birth to three years old program. And now you're develop, you have developed a partnership with the Higher Education and the Department of Labor's to gather post-secondary data. This is the Department of Labor's database. It's called the Workforce Data Quality Initiative. It links the uh, student longitudinal data system with workforce data so we can track individuals through school and into and through their work life. The objective is to enable workforce data to be matched with education data to create a longitudinal data system with individual level information beginning with pre-kindergarten through post-secondary schooling all the way through entry and sustained participation in the workforce and employment services section. It is a lifelong dossier that is being developed and it's a collaboration between the Department of Education and the Department of Labor. And the data includes here in West Virginia and in every other state, we go to all of the other um, agencies to link the data together and we start as your documents say from birth so if your kids in a daycare center they start assessing them right away additionally you had to do the standards and there were um, requirements for that as well that we're going to run through very quickly so I'm going to skip a bunch we're going to talk about math when the math standards were being written, William McCallum, who was actually one of the 29 folks, attended the National Council of Math Educators, and they hated the standards. But he told them, don't worry, because they won't be too high. The College Board said calculus is outside the Common Core standards because Common Core slows the math progression down. The National Center for Education and the Economy, in their document called What Does It Mean to Be College and Work Ready, said that means being ready to go to a community college, middle school math, Algebra 1 by the end of your sophomore year in high school. Because they say most community colleges start with Algebra 1, so you don't need to take Algebra 2 in high school to take Algebra 1 in college. And they recognize that these were low. Is that a good idea? No. The U.S. Department of Education actually does study education. In 1999, they published a document called Answers in the Toolbox saying what leads to success in college. If you get past Algebra 2 in high school, you more than double your odds of getting a bachelor's degree. That study became the basis of a 25-year meta-analysis done by Auburn University that said as secondary math rose, 
college success rose with it, and the kids that got to calculus in high school were 28 times. I didn't say percent. I said times. That's 2,800%. More likely not just to finish college, but to be a high achiever, regardless of their race, their socioeconomic status, or the kind of high school they went to, or the major that they took. So what leads to success in college? Giving our kids the opportunity to get as far ahead as they can in math. What does Common Core do? Exactly the opposite. How can we say this is a good idea? English is the same. This is a Common Core, and here it is. This is 12th grade Common Core by Pearson, who is the largest publisher of Common Core materials. And on the very first page of the children's book, the first thing they tell these 17-year-olds is that every selection in this book is available in audio format with an audio summary. So the first thing we tell kids is that you don't have to read a single word of the book. And I did a presentation and a teacher said, oh, well, you know, Dr. Book said, um, no, no teacher would do that. And I said to her, so you've never taught 17-year-olds. Because if you tell 17-year-olds you don't have to read it, guess what they're not going to do? They're not going to read it. And the very first thing that they tell them is every selection in this book, they can listen to it. And if they don't want to listen to it, they can listen to a summary created by the publisher, which will allow them to complete the activities in the book without ever reading a single selection in the book. Now, this is my granddaughter. And why am I showing her to you? Well, she's adorable. But because you have a face just like that in your life. One that when you see it, it makes your heart sing. In my state of Pennsylvania, the Department of Education testified in front of, on behalf of Common Core, and they called the children widgets. And yes, they used the word. And they said, well, you know, if you buy a hamburger in a McDonald's in this city, and then you go to that city and buy a hamburger, it's the same hamburger. So no matter where the schools are, shouldn't the children be the same? Is the hamburger the client of McDonald's or the product? It's the product. When did our children move from being the clients of the educational system to being the products of the educational system? And if they're the product, who's the client? Does anybody think that we do to the hamburgers something that's good for the hamburgers? No. You do something to a product for a client. Common Core isn't something we're doing for our children. It's something we're doing to them. I get asked all the time, why did you come here? because I need to protect that face. And you have a face just like that. And now you know the truth. I get asked all the time, are we gonna win? It's amazing how many women are leading this charge. That's not an accident. It's been said that fathers will die for their children. God love you, gentlemen. That's true. <laughs> Mothers will kill. <laughs> and when the federal government decided to declare war on the children of America, they forgot all of those kids had moms and grandmoms attached, and there will never come a day when we're going to say, oh, that's okay, you can have them. But how fast we change this depends entirely on you. The worst thing you can do is nothing. Stand up, get involved, protect your own children. Support the legislators who are supporting you. Work on the ones who aren't. I get... Those little ones have one shot at their future. They are waiting to see what you are going to do to protect them. My question to you is, what will your answer be? Thank you very much. Okay, we want to leave some time for some questions. I want to remind everybody before you leave, though, we have our uh, Save Our Students shirts in the back and some things you can uh, purchase as well. Are your CDs back there? Uh, back there. So if you have to leave while we're going through some of the questions, uh, please feel free to do so quietly. But I know there's a number of questions that we want to kind of get around to everybody in different groups because we have parents here. Are there any school board members here, county school board members? I, I did invite Gail Manchin, the president of the school board. Is she here? No. I, I, and by the way, I invited uh, Wade Linger from Marion County who's on the school board, uh, Mrs. Manchin. I invited all of the school board members from Mon County, Taylor County, 
Harrison County and Marion County. So I did, I took it upon myself to invite them to come to listen. And before we get started with some questions, uh, let's give these legislators a big hand for being here to listen and to be good leaders. Mr. Chapa, you wanted to ask a question first? Go ahead. Um, this is an objection that I heard down in Charleston this year was that, uh, um, that this, the common core of the standards, the curriculum, the curriculum problems are not the standards issues, okay? And so um, I believe that from what I've researched that the curriculum's job is to try to get to the standards. In my, I'm right there. Um, one of the, the, the objections was that the curriculum was purchased hastily from a company that produces it in China because the Chinese are good at math. It is basically what I heard from somebody that said since the Chinese are good at math and they use the Chinese company to select and, and that was the objective. It was a problem with the curriculum here in West Virginia. Do you have any comments on that? Yes. Um, actually, let's look at the federal government. This is from the federal government, and we kind of jumped over this for time. The federal government, when they brought the states together, said, here's the standards. We have to approve your standards. Here's the assessments. We have to approve your assessments. You must align the instruction to the standards and the assessments. It goes like this. If the standard is everybody has to make a chocolate cake that tastes just like my chocolate cake and has the same texture as my chocolate cake. See my cake? It's a really good cake. And the assessment is I'm coming to taste your cake. How many recipes can there be? One, because you won't pass the test. In fact, stand, if I control the test, I control what is taught. The largest publisher of Common Core Materials actually is Pearson. And they're a British company, not a Chinese company. So it, and are their materials poor? Yes, they are very poor. But all the Common Core materials are poor because the Common Core itself is poorly constructed. So the, the whole goal is to grab control of every level of education. And when you talk to teachers all over the country, what they say is, some of them are telling me, I walk into my classroom and I'm being handed, this is what you're going to say today. So that we're all teaching the same thing. If you listen to the proponents of Common Core, one of the arguments that they use, although not so much anymore because I've debated a few of them, but they used to say all the time, was this is for the children of the military because everywhere they go, they need to be able to jump in and out of school, so the schools all need to be doing the same thing. Well, if the curriculum's different, how can that work? So it's, it is designed to be one curriculum. And in fact, um, the National Center for Education and the Economy, they did the document that we looked at what, is, uh, what does it mean to be college and work ready. And that actually says what is tested is what is taught. And everybody knows it and everybody has always known it in education. If the standard is times tables and you walk into my classroom, you're going to see me teaching times tables. So they knew that they were in the feds, told them from the very beginning, align your instruction. For sake of time, is there a parent now that would like to ask a question? Yeah. Yes, sir. With respect to the longitudinal data system that you were describing earlier, I think we can all understand why individuals and families would see that as a bad thing and a dangerous thing. I'm curious as to how the Common Core people justify it as a good idea. How do they sell that as something that they ought to be involved in? Let me tell you what they're doing in Delaware, because that's the fruition of the plan. In Delaware, Delaware got the very first round of race to the top money. So they're, they're ahead of everybody. In Delaware, they start assessing the children at one year. And daycare centers are required to assess. There's a pre-kindergarten entrance. They assess their language and their cognitive ability. And in fact, you're doing that in West Virginia, too. They give them all kinds of assessments. And by the time they're in eighth grade, the students have to have what's called a student success plan in place. That plan, the government uses all of the information, and the school gives them what's called a career matchmaker. It's a list of 10, up to 10, um, careers that the child can choose from. They must choose from within the list. And then all of their high school is geared toward reaching the career in their student success plan. Parents can look at their child's student success plan. They cannot change it and that's right in the documents. The folks pushing this are very open about the fact that this is workforce development. Uh, Delaware has signed in on to the Commission on the New American Workforce that calls for uh, a rehash of school to work. 
that there will be labor management boards authorized by the federal government that will determine the labor market needs of the region. And then this, the purpose of the schools is to make sure that we have people slotted in to fill those slots. So it's really two worldviews competing. Most parents see education as this is opening doors so that my child can be what he wants to be. But the proponents of this see education as creating a workforce with each worker having the skills they need to do their job and nothing else so that we have kind of a planned and stable system and they see that as a good. So it's really two worldviews competing. But what about going beyond school into the, once a child graduates and takes a job and they, conti they continue to monitor the information? Yes. Or, or the health records and the dental records. What's that? How do they justify um, What that? they say is that we need all the information, all the access to health and dental and family records to um, determine if this child might be at risk to do early intervention, to be able to make sure we move them in the correct path in this student success plan. And the labor data, it includes like your wages and if you've ever been on unemployment to see well, okay, where did you come from and what was it worth? It's, it's kind of a rating system that, that they're looking at. And I mean, most parents go, ooh, yuck. But I've debated proponents of this, and they actually think this is a really good idea. So it's not, this isn't a hidden conspiracy. They're really very open about it, and, and they're very proud of it. So um, you, you can actually read it. The, the guy who wrote the document, What Does It Mean to Be College and uh, Work Ready? The president of that organization is a man named Mark Tucker. If you Google Mark Tucker, M-A-R-C, Mark, you will find a 1992 letter written to uh, Hillary Clinton upon the election of her husband. It's been read into the congressional record. And it actually talks about this whole new plan for the purpose of education and its workforce development and the labor market boards. And he was very proud of it. And he had a document then called uh, America's Choice High Skills or Low, Low Wages. And in 2013, it's called America's Choice, Tough Times or Tough Choices. And you can put the words and the, the graphs on top of each other. It's the same document. No more resume. <laughs> it's an go, electronic you can, resume. You go to apply for a job, for the federal government job first, probably, or the service. They look up your permanent record that's been maintained by your public school system. And everybody knows somebody who's messed up in high school who turned out to be a great contributing member of the community. Uh, after, after school and, and over the years, another legislator now has a question. Community leader, yes, sir. Yes, sir. We've been here all along. I've heard, I'm sure that our legislators have heard this. We've all heard from our board of education and whatever. That this data is never shared and never leaves the state, and that's what's being told us. No, that is that's. I'm, I'm sorry. That's just. Factually incorrect. I know. Um, what they do is they cite a federal law called the Federal Education Rights and Privacy Act, FERPA. In 2011, the U.S. Department of Education rewrote the regulations around FERPA. And the new regulations say that anyone who has a, and the, the quote is a legitimate educational interest or is an, um, an agent of the educational system, and that includes vendors can have access to the data. And how do you know they have a legitimate educational interest? They fill out a form and tell you that they do. So, and the data, as you saw in your own state, is being made available to researchers on an ongoing basis. I was in, where was I? I was in Rhode Island. And a mother said that her little one was in some research thing in Rhode Island that was supposed to be all private. And two years later, she got a call from a researcher in Florida who wanted to follow up on the Rhode Island information. Well, how did they find her? And how did they know if it wasn't identifiable? And it has to cross state lines because that's an element of the American Competes Act. So it's, it's this is a, they tell you things that I wish that they were true, but they're not. Dr. Butler. Yes. After we passed a repeal bill in the House and went to the Senate, the senators, I think, were promised, and I was told this, that we can fix this, we can tweak it, Actually, I was in Tennessee. I testify in front of lots of state legislatures, so I'm in front of a bunch of them. I was actually in Tennessee in front of the Senate Education Committee, and one of the representatives of the Common Core was there, and the senator said just what you asked. Well, what if we don't like some of these? Can we take them out? And the guy said, well, you can add up to 15%. And the senator said, but I want to subtract some. 
And he said, well, you can add up to 15%. And the senator said, so in other words, the answer is no. They're copyrighted. You may not change them. They are a package. You have to keep them. And in fact, that's what your Race to the Top grant said, that you had a promise you would accept them as a package deal in total. You don't have that option. Parent question. Yes, sir. Uh, I'm from the state of Maryland. Most of these cities from the state of confusion. And uh, we have so many problems down there. How do we get rid of, how do we get rid of Common Core? Where, where, where do we go? Who do we see? What do we have to do? What is happening across the country is state legislators who were not involved in the adoption are beginning to be involved in the repeal. So just this week, the uh, state of Tennessee passed legislation repealing it. it it's, it's kind of a weak, weak bill, but they did it. Uh, South Carolina repealed it. Oklahoma repealed it. But then the Fed step in and just change the name and try to bring it back. So this is going to be a process, but it's the same thing we did with outcome-based education and school to work in the 90s, and you just have to be more stubborn than they are. The answer in the end is to tell the federal government, go home. As long as the feds are in charge, you can't stop it. I'm calling my grandchildren schools and just looked at the books, mm -hmm. especially like the history books and some of the math books and all. Ridiculous. It's really sad. The the history changes that Dr. Luxick said talked about are on your disc, yes. right? If you don't take anything home with you, find a way to take that disc home. People won't believe that you can talk about American history and not include Thomas Jefferson or World War II and not talk about Dwight D. Eisenhower. They they they'll they think we're quacks and in fact tomorrow or sometime next week, as typical for our State Board of Education. They will attack you. That's okay. They attack the messenger. If you remember, we had uh, Dr. Uh, Stotsky in, uh, in Bridgeport, 200 people, a lot of legislators were there. Uh, 200 people come, and what did they do? They attacked her. They attacked her, they attacked the messenger, and not the message. That's Other right. questions? Any Ch Chairman Seifel? Thank you. Uh, what sort of progress is being made on the national level to roll back the authority and uh, intervention of the Department of Education in the states? They are in the process of reauthorizing the Elementary and Secondary Education Act. They brought the bill forward twice, and because of public pressure, they've had to pull it off the calendar twice because they had we've had enough people that they couldn't get the votes. So it's it's a process, and and like the folks like us, we understand that. We have to fight this at the federal level. But when states say no, it helps to put the pressure backwards. What the feds will tell you is you'll lose your state money. Well, if you don't do this, you'll lose your state money. The ESEA is what's called a formula grant. You didn't have to apply for it. I was in Idaho. They had a new superintendent who called and said, I can't find the contracts. I said, well, there aren't any. Because the ESEA, you turn in your poverty numbers. It's a, it's a big, long formula you have to use. You turn them in uh, by the state, by the district, and then by the individual school. And the amount of money you get is exactly based on those numbers. There's no provision in the law to take any of that money away from you based on anything that you do. It's strictly, it, it was part of the war on poverty. So it's a response to your poverty numbers. What they can do is eliminate some flexibility from some schools. And that's all. So the state of Washington, categorically, which is funny because in Washington, like Oklahoma is as Republican as you can be, and the state of Washington is as Democrat as you can be, and both states have said no. So the state of Washington categorically refused to tie teacher evaluations to the assessments, saying just like you saw the assessments are not that. And, and the state of Washington is the fiscal agent.